welcome everyone. Welcome to today's Winter Garden Forum. My name is Lauren Williams and I am uh, Adult and Community Services Manager at the Columbia Public Library, which is part of the Daniel Boone Regional Library System. We're glad to be co-hosting this program today with the Discovery Garden Club. This is our ninth year of co-hosting this forum and the second one that we have presented online. We appreciate you all being here with us on this beautiful sunny day um, and we will continue to think good thoughts about 2023 and hope that we can all gather in community in the friends room um, at that time for the next forum. But in the meantime, uh, we will get going here today online. This annual event is one of my favorites, um, thinking about the promise of plants and herbs and flowering trees in the, sp um, in the spring makes the cold, dark January a little more bearable. Uh, the music that we were playing as you came in is uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. And I was, I have to say, I was streaming that through the library's uh, service called Freegal, and that is for free. So if you wanna check out some streaming and downloadable music, check out our website. Um, and now I'll turn things over to Janet Lindstrom with the Discovery Garden Club. Oh, yes, hi. Well, greetings, everyone. I'm sorry, again, we're not in person, but hopefully next year, since it's going to be our 10th anniversary of this event, we're really hoping to be back in the friends room. We have two interesting speakers today. We have a talk on lavender growing in Missouri and then growing fruit trees in your backyard. Our first speaker will be on lavender, and it's Kelly McGowan, who's been with the University of Missouri Extension for eight years and serves as field specialist in horticulture, working primarily with home gardeners in southwest Missouri. Areas of concentration include vegetable production, soil fertility, pollinator education, sustainable home landscapes, and she's very busy. She serves as Master Gardener Coordinator and Master Naturalist Co Coordinator. Her research interests include elderberries, lavender production, commercial garlic production, and locating populations of the Ozark swallowtail butterfly. Um, Kelly has her degree in hort horticulture from Missouri State University's our School of Agriculture. She has a Master's of Science degree in Natural Resources and Agroforestry from the University of Missouri, and her thesis was on elderberry flower production. So um, I'm very interested to hear about growing lavender in Missouri. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me, Janet. I'm certainly um, excited to be here and share a little bit about what I've learned about lavender. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, how does that look? Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, well, my name is Kelly McGowan and I work for University of Missouri Extension and I am in the Springfield area. And I'm gonna talk to you today about growing lavender in Missouri. Um, I've been involved with lavender research. This will be my second year. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, some things that me and my research team have learned about growing lavender in Missouri, so that if you have an interest in growing it, you know, as a homeowner or commercially, um, you'll have some, some tools to help you along. Okay, so why lavender? Why study lavender? Well, there is the potential to, to be profitable on a very small acreage. You know, lavender is one of those crops you don't need a ton of space to grow. And for those that want to grow it commercially, you know, that's very appealing. You don't have to plant, you know, 30 acres of it. You can just start very small. There are not any grower guides for lavender for the state of Missouri. For those of you that are familiar with the University of Missouri Extension, you may be familiar with our grower guides that are available for free on lots of different types of crops, but we don't have anything on, on lavender. There's a lot of interest out there, so we are wanting to put, some, put together some grower guides for lavender in the state. There's lots and lots of interest from commercial growers and from homeowners. And when I started doing this project last year, I was amazed at the number of people that had heard about this research project and wanted to learn more about it. And it just continues. I just, I keep getting inquiries from people wanting to learn about growing lavender. So that was a big part of uh, behind our research as well. And as you're um, probably most of you are aware of, there are a lot of value added products that you can make with lavender. If you've ever purchased 
like lavender essential oil, you know that, you know, it can be a little bit pricey. And that's because a lot of work goes into distilling that oil. But there's also bath products and dried flowers and just all kinds of things that you can do with lavender. So the potential is certainly there. And there's the potential of agritourism. If, you know, someone is interested in opening up a lavender farm and having people come out to the farm and harvest their own lavender or take pictures or buy your products, that is certainly a very appealing thing to do with lavender as well. So a little bit about the history of our research project is um, funding was provided by the Missouri Department of Agriculture Specialty Crop Block Grant. Field work began in spring of last year and the project will continue through the end of this year. We may continue it, continue it on next year. We haven't really decided yet. And we have three sites around Missouri that are planted with lavender. I have a site in Springfield, Missouri. We have one in St. Genevieve, Missouri and one in Kirksville, Missouri. And we wanted to have different growing climates represented in our research. You know, do, do types that grow well in Springfield also grow well in Kirksville since they have harsher winters? We wanted to look at all those types of things. Now we're using six main cultivars for our lavender research. And the six that, that, that I chose for this project for this project was based on feedback and research that I had done with growers in the Midwest. These were the most popular ones that were used and therefore the ones that we wanted to do research on as well. They include Dutch Mill, Grosso, Munstead, Hidcote, Phenomenal, and Provence. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those as we go through the presentation. Now, we also experimented with lots of other types, but these six were our main types that we wanted to study. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about lavender as a plant. Well, a lot of people don't realize that lavender is a desert plant. It is a native to desert areas, to hot, arid regions of the world. That's where it's native to. And whenever I'm doing a class on any type of plant, you know, I encourage people to find out where it originates from and do all you can to replicate that at your own home. But in the case of lavender, it is a desert plant. It likes hot, dry, sunny summers, which we certainly have here in Missouri. It needs well-drained soil. So if you don't remember anything else I say today about lavender, remember that it needs well-drained soil. It does not like wet feet. It does not like rich moisture holding soil. It likes poor soil. It, it can grow well in poor soil. It does well in our native Missouri soil, but it has to stay well-drained. It cannot tolerate wet saturated soils. Um, lavender is considered a woody shrub and it, with proper care, it can live for up to 10 years. So it is definitely a perennial plant and um, that's good because lavender plants can be a little bit pricey. Um, one thing is that most commercial lavender is grown in France. It's grown in France. And that's one of the things that we want to change with our research project. We want to encourage people to grow it commercially here in Missouri and around the Midwest because we can grow it quite well. And why import it when we can grow it right here? So that's one of the, the parts of this project as well. So another thing that's kind of interesting about lavender is yes, it can be grown in poor soils, but it can also be grown in contaminated soils. And it can also be used as a phytoremediation plant. So basically what that means is that there, if there is a site that has had some kind of a, a heavy metal spill or the soil is heavily contaminated for various reasons, lavender has been used 
to uh, help take up some of those heavy metals. It's really good at taking up toxins out of the soil and to helping to rehab that soil. So that's really interesting, uh, a really interesting characteristic of lavender as well. So it is a perennial shrub in the mint family and mint family plants are, um, have square stems, they have opposite leaves and they're very aromatic. If you've grown any plants in the mint family, you've probably noticed these characteristics. Lavender can vary in sizes. It can be really large and it can be really small. There are some miniature varieties that are only about a foot in diameter. And then there's some really large ones that can be six feet or more. Um, one that comes to mind is a newer cultivar called Phenomenal. It is a very big lavender plant. So if you're wanting to purchase and grow lavender, make sure that you're paying close attention to what the cultivar is um, so that you can know what the mature size is of that because you wanna make sure that you give it plenty of room to grow. The flowers are on a spike, a flower spike, which is called an inflorescence. And the flowering time can be anywhere from May until fall. I've got some pictures here you'll see in just a moment. I actually harvested lavender up until our, our first uh, fall frost, which was here in Missouri, it was in November of last year. And up until that time, I was harvesting flowers. So, you know, depending on the cultivar, it can bloom all summer long, which is a really nice thing to have. Individual blooms can last about two to three weeks, so they are considered a long-lived bloom. And one of the things that I love about lavender is just the, the variation in color. You know, I'm sure you're all aware that lavender is purple, which it is, but there's lots of shades of purple. There's really light purples, there's really dark purples, and everything in between, but there's also white, there's pink, and there's even a yellow type that I'm trying to grow. I haven't had a lot of success with it yet, but uh, hopefully I can get it to do better this summer. So here's a photo I took uh, this past November. This was actually November the 9th here in Springfield. And I, I liked this picture because I kind of grouped them all together. And you can see the names of the different types. But, you know, I worked with this lavender all summer, and until I got all of them laying out next to each other, I didn't even really realize all of the variations in color. And you can see here, there's really light purples, there's really dark purples. There's also a lot of variations in the length of the stem, which is interesting depending on what you want to use the lavender for. But um, it's just really interesting to see all of these right beside each other. Now, 2021 was an establishment year for our research plants, and it does take a couple of years for the plants to really get established and really start to bloom well. But even my first year for my research plants, you can see here, we certainly got a really good harvest. They did really well, and uh, hopefully it'll be even better this summer. Okay, types of lavender. There's typically two types. There is the lavandula intermedia. Sometimes uh, French lavenders fall into this category. And these are things like Grosso, Provence, Dutch Mill, and Phenomenal. And there's lots of other types as well. And then I'm sure most of you are familiar with English lavender, uh, scientific name of Angustifolia. This is the Hidcoat and the Munstead. These, these typically are the most popular types of English lavender. Now, a little bit about the differences between the intermedias and the angustifolias is the English lavenders are typically the first ones to bloom. They will be the ones that start to bloom in May. And these, these types have a milder flavor. So if you want to use lavender in cooking or some type of culinary, type of a product, English lavenders are the, the most common type that are cooked with. 
Now, certainly you could use any of these for cooking, but uh, the English ones tend to be the preferred ones for, for culinary use. So here's a little bit of data on balloons. And this is a list of all the ones that we experimented with last year. And when they bloomed, I kept, we kept data on when they bloomed. Um, the yellow boxes next to each of the names indicates a month where they did not bloom. And, you know, I mentioned here, let's go back and look at this. So Hidcote and Munstead are English lavenders, typically the earliest bloomers. But in my chart here, they didn't bloom early. And that just, that could be because they didn't get planted till a little later. I think they were planted in May, just because we had a ton of rain and weren't able to get them in the ground as early as we wanted. Uh, but once they were kind of settled in, they started blooming and did quite well. Now, a couple of types, actually three different types, uh, the Dutch mill, the Grappenhall, which just a side note, Grappenhall is a really, really big plant as well. And the Phenomenal, we did not get any blooms from them last year. And that just may be because it was first year for those plants to be in the ground. And hopefully this year we'll get some spectacular blooms. But all of the rest, as you can see, bloomed really, really well. And again, we got blooms up through November of last year. Okay, so taking care of lavender plants. You know, again, keep in mind that it does take two or three years for them to reach full maturity and full flower production. You don't have to fertilize lavender plants. Now, when we planted our research plots, we did take a soil test and did add some things that were deficient in the soil, but it wasn't very much. But as far as ongoing fertilization, don't have to worry about it. Again, they're a desert plant. They like poor soil. So fertilization is not something that you need to worry about with lavender. And once they're established, they don't need very much water. They're very drought tolerant. Now, first and second year plants, you will need to give them some water during the hot, dry part of the summer. Uh, but once they're established, they don't, they're not going to need very much water. So it's a great option as a drought resistant plant. Um, annual pruning and shaping, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But then again, remember that proper spacing. Know what the mature size of that plant is going to be so that you can space them out properly and get a lot of good airflow around your plants. Okay, so here's my spring field um, planting. And you can see here that we grew on a black landscape fabric and just... Um, you know, burnt a hole where we planted each of the plants and then run drip tape down each of the rows. And this was set up on an automated timer and I think it watered three times a week for one to two hours, depending on how much rainfall that we got. And that may seem like a lot, but it was very, very slowly trickling out. So it was actually ended up being very little water. Um, but the plants thrived. They really did well in Springfield last year, so I was really happy with the way that it turned out. So, you know, we don't live in the desert here in Missouri, so I, I get a lot of questions. Well, can we grow lavender here in Missouri? Most people are more concerned about winter than um, it being able to survive winter than summer. Lavender can survive well in growing zones of five to nine. And there's even lavender grown, you know, up in the northern part of the U.S. and the southern part of Canada. It can survive our winters. It, it, believe it or not, it can survive our winters. What kills lavender in the winter is extreme fluctuations in temperature, which we've certainly had some this winter. You know, we have days like, um, you know, it'll get up in the 60s and then a few days later, it'll be down below zero at night. That's really hard on lavender. And then wet soil in the winter is hard on lavender as well. Again, it does not like wet feet. Um, plant it in full sun, make sure that it's not getting any shade. It won't do well in shade. It needs as much full sun as you can get it. 
And then just be aware of the soil needs for lavender. And so it needs a sandy loam to a coarse gravelly soil. And again, it does well in our native Missouri soils. You know, it, it does really well. A uh, pH of around seven is ideal, but we found in our research plots that our uh, soil has been a little bit below seven. So it may not be as big of a deal as we once thought it was. We're gonna learn more about that as we go on with our research, but the suggested pH is around seven. If it's too alkaline, if it gets above seven, there can be some deficiencies in boron. Um, that's been shown in some of the northern parts of the U.S. But again, and I've, I've said it several times already, it needs a well-drained soil. It needs a well-drained soil in both winter and summer. Okay, so how can you improve your soil? Well, do a soil test, find out what the pH is, um, adjust any nutrient deficiencies that you might have. If you're wanting to plant lavender, observe that planting area over a period of time. You know, does it hold water after a heavy rain or do you notice that it's uh, drying out pretty well? Raised beds or raised rows is a great option for growing lavender. And I don't know if you can see this picture here on the right. It doesn't look like much, but all of our research plots, we planted on raised rows. And we made the rows about 12 inches, about 12 inches high. And if I had it to go back and do again, I would even make it a little bit taller. But you can see here in this picture on the very right, this was after a very, very, very rainy period. The soil was just absolutely had standing water in it. But this is our raised row. This is our raised row. And you can see that the very top of that soil is dry. So that just shows you that raised rows can really help with that water drainage. Okay, I get a lot of questions about winter protection and I've done a lot of research on winter protection. I've talked to growers and some cover their plants in winter, some don't do anything. They just leave them to the elements. And as far as our research, pro our research plots, we're doing the same thing. Some of our plants are gonna be covered and some of them are gonna be left to the elements. And then as we get into spring, we'll compare the survival rate of, you know, amongst the two. So there'll be more information to come on that. But again, they can be left to the elements and be just fine. Um, a lot of our commercial growers do that here in Missouri. Okay, pruning lavender. Um, you want to do it about twice a year. You want to do it in the spring once they start to green up a little bit and they get a little bit of growth on them. And then you want to do it in the summer after you're done harvesting. And the main thing to keep in mind when it comes to pruning lavender is you want your, your goal shape is about the shape of a basketball. So you want to keep that shape in mind and you don't want to take off any more than a third of the foliage at a time. So just cut off about a third of the foliage. You don't want to take too much off. You don't want to get down in the woody part of the plant because the plant just won't look right. It'll have a weird shape to it. So a basketball shaped, pruned twice a year. Don't take it off any more than a third of the foliage. And that's really all you need to do. All right, harvesting. You want to harvest the flowers when the bottom when the bottom flowers on the inflorescence are open. That's when it's going to have its peak color and its peak fragrance. When it starts to get brown, it's it's a little bit past its peak at that time. It'll still smell good. It'll still look good. But if you want the peak time to harvest, um, just when those bottom flowers on the flower spike are starting to open. And then you want to cut the stems down to where the foliage begins. And these are just some interesting photos of lavender harvest. You can see people out in the field harvesting, um, making bundles as they go. And there's a picture here of a tractor doing a large scale commercial harvest. Um, in our research plots, really my favorite way to do it is just your plain old office scissors or, or kitchen scissors. 
just, I, I get all of the flowers in my hand. I just make a couple of cuts and I'm done with that plant. So it's pretty easy to harvest. Drying your bouquets, you wanna dry them upside down in some kind of a dry area, dry dark location for about 10 to 14 days. The flowers stay on the stems pretty well. And um, really that's all you have to do. Just hang them upside down and just let them dry. Uh, fresh bouquets of lavender. It, this is kind of different from other fresh bouquets of flowers, but you don't want to put them in water. If you put them on water, it speeds up the decaying process and they'll just turn mushy and won't last very long. But if someone gives you a fresh bouquet of lavender, just put it in a vase without any water and it'll dry on its own that way as well. This is just a little bit about the Springfield uh, research site. It's at the Springfield Botanical Gardens. So if you're ever in that area, um, you, you feel free to stop by and take a look at it. Um, you can see here the picture on May 26th and then compare that to the picture on November the 9th. And that kind of shows you what the growth was like um, throughout the summer last year. Uh, we had ideal conditions in Springfield. We had a lot of early rain, but the rest of the summer was great and the plants thrived. It was the same in Kirksville last year. St. Genevieve, however, had nonstop rain, nonstop heavy rain all summer, and she ended up losing most of her plants just because even with those raised rows, it was just too much for the plants and they couldn't withstand all of that wet soil condition. So we're going to um, have to rehab that area this spring and uh, try to come up with another plan. And this is just some growth data um, about the different types that we grew. They all did really well. We took uh, growth on height and width. So that's just what that is. Insect issues. Lavender really doesn't have a lot of insect issues. The main one is spider mites. And you can tell if you have spider mites by the uh, yellowish tint to the foliage. And boy, I mean, I was out watching my plants almost every day and didn't even realize I had spider mites until the problem was really bad. Spider mites like really hot, dry conditions, same as lavender, and um, they can just really wreak havoc on the plants. And so what we did is we bought a miticide and miticide is different than an insecticide. It just targets mites and a little bottle of it is pretty pricey, but one spray and it really took care of the problem. So I was pretty happy about that. It wasn't something that we had to spray over and over and over, just one application and it really had that problem under control. Um, late in the season, we did have some spittle bug issues. And if you're, you know, you're growing lavender for commercial harvest, you don't want spittle bug spittle in your flower bundles. Um, but we did again find that that was an end of the season issue when most of the flowering was done. And boy, one of my most favorite things about lavender was just all of the insects and pollinators being out there working in my plots and seeing butterflies and Oh, the, the insects just absolutely love to feed on those flowers. So that was just a really cool surprise. I knew it was gonna be like that, but um, didn't know I would have that many insects out there joining me. So that was really nice. So just to wrap it up here, what we've learned, uh, plant on raised rows at least 12 inches or more if you can do it. Uh, raised beds work well, containers work well. I grew lavender in containers last year and it, they flourished in large containers. Plan on plant loss each year. Some of the plants are gonna die. That's just, you know, our, our weird weather here in Missouri. Sometimes there's just nothing we can do. Some of our plants are gonna die. Um, lavender is really easy to propagate. So, you know, if this is something you're interested in, experiment with propagating your own plants from cuttings. Every site is different. Boy, we have learned this over and over. 
cultivars that do well in Springfield might not do so well in Kirksville or other parts of the state. So experiment with lots of different cultivars and find out which, which one does best in your site. Um, and then as far as on an economic uh, and commercial side of lavender, we need resources out there to connect growers with buyers. There's people that want to grow. There's people that want to buy. We've just got to find that piece of the puzzle that connects those two. And then we just need more economic study that says, okay, if I have a quarter of an acre, you know, how much lavender do I need to plant to make X amount of money? So we just need to do more on the economic side as well. This year, we're going to start doing some essential oil distilling. Uh, we bought a really nice distiller. It just came in, and one of the members of our research team is going to, 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 he is going to do the distilling for us and just compare yields among some of the different cultivars. So that's going to be really cool. Um, we'll continue to take data on the flower yields. Um, we're going to continue to experiment with soil drainage solutions. We're gonna experiment with new cultivars. Um, just a quick example of that, our St. Genevieve site that I said, you know, she lost almost all of her plants because there was so much rain. Well, there was a type called Super Blue that survived. It, it survived. So I just, I guess it's just more tolerant to wet feet. So we'll certainly be doing more trials with that. Um, we're going to do a high tunnel planting of lavender this year and see if that helps with soil drainage. And then we're going to have some in-person workshops around the state if you want to learn more. So I think that is it. Um, and there's my contact information. If you ever want to reach out, um, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, and we have three questions uh, so far. How well does lavender do in clay soil? In clay soil, that is a great question. We certainly have a lot of clay soil, especially here in the southern part of the state. Um, although we have clay soil in Missouri and clay tends to hang on better to moisture than other types of soil, I haven't found it to be that big of a problem unless we just have nonstop heavy rains. But the, the, soil, the, the soil in my Springfield, my Springfield plot, it's, it's very heavy clay and um, it's done just fine. Okay. Another question I have is where does a small grower purchase the cultivars? That is a great question. I get so many questions about where to purchase lavender. Um, so I work with a lady here in Springfield. Um, she has a small backyard herb business. It's called Red Barn Herb Farm. Um, she grew most of our plants for our research project. Now she doesn't do anything large scale. Um, as far as other types that we've grown, we've really had to kind of piecemeal, you know, certain online nurseries may have you know, 10 of this kind and 10 of this kind. Um, but that is one thing that we need to learn more about is where do we go to buy large scale amounts of plants? I just have not been able to find that yet. So if anybody on this today knows of some great places to buy plants, I would be, I would love to hear that. There's kind of a follow-up that somebody wanted to know if you can start lavender from seed. That is a great question. You can grow lavender from seed. It's actually surprisingly easy to grow from seed, but if you're wanting a certain cultivar, it is pretty well known in the lavender is industry that seeds, like if you buy a package of seeds and it says Munstead, well, you may grow it and it might not be Munstead at all. It might be some other type of cultivar. So if you don't care about cultivars and you're just wanting lavender, by all means, grow it. But if you're wanting specific cultivars, seed is not the best option. And can you recommend a cultivar that does well in Columbia, Missouri? Well, um, I will tell you, my favorite from last year was the one called Provence or Province. Um, 
It had the long flower spikes. It had amazing smell. And I actually did an experiment with some of my master gardeners and had them smell the different types. And they, uh, Provence was their favorite as well. But um, the Grosso, the Munstead, um, phenomenal, I think is gonna be wonderful next year. Those all do well in your area. They're in the Columbia area. So, so definitely any of those would be great. Okay. And then another question was, can you grow lavender on a hillside or is that not the right kind of drainage? Yeah, actually on a hillside would be a great option for drainage. So absolutely. Okay. And then one other thing I'll throw in there, since you guys are in the Columbia area, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Battlefield Lavender in Centralia. And they're actually partnering with us on our research project. So I really encourage you to visit their farm. They're starting to get into selling plants, not lots of plants, but some. Uh, they've got a beautiful farm. The plants are well labeled. They're very open to educating people that want to learn more about lavender. They've got a new barn where they do classes and sell products. It's just a really cool local place that you guys might want to check out. Um, they have a website and a Facebook page that tells when they're open. So that's a good option for you guys. Okay, I think I have time for one more question. Um, okay. And that is, when, you're, when do you cut the starts of your plants to make more plants? Well, you can really do it anytime we found. We're, we're experimenting with that. We, one of the members of our research team has really been experimenting with that. Um, but we're really finding that anytime throughout the growing season, you can take little cuttings from your plants and start new plants. Um, so we're really not saying, oh, just in fall or just in spring, really any time has been fine. And then um, I think we'll do one more question. My internet connection isn't very, is told, just telling me it's unstable. So hopefully you'll hear me. What about lavender and other herbs makes them particularly good at uptaking heavy metals? Lavender and other herbs uptaking heavy metals. Well, I'm not aware of other herbs that uptake heavy metals, so I'm not really sure if I can answer that question. Um, another plant that is good about uh, bioremediating the soil is um, sunflowers. If anybody grows sunflowers, they're kind of a classic plant that, that can remediate the soil as well. Okay, and I think, okay, one last question. Are there, uh, what types are better for culinary use versus sachets? I think you touched on that a little bit. Yeah, so the English lavenders are uh, the, what is typically used for culinary. And then as far as sachets, um, I made a bunch of sachets for, for Christmas just with the plants I'd grown. And really any of them make great sachets. So oh, okay. I, in any lavenders would make a good sachet. Well, thank you very much. This is this is very interesting. I would never have thought you could grow lavender in this state. So, oh, one one other thing, I'll I'll just throw in there. Deer do not like lavender, so if you have a problem <laughs> with deer, they're they're deer proof. That's good. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. That was that was just fascinating. I really appreciate learning more about lavender. Um, now, Lauren, do you want to take a little break before we do the door prizes, or should we just go right into the door prizes? I think let's go right into the door prizes. Okay. We have six door prizes today and they are, uh, Lauren uh, randomly selected them from the, the people that are currently viewing this program. So our first door prize is a $10 e-gift card to Lookout Lavender. And that goes to Melissa Reddick. And Lookout Lavender does sell at the farmer's market and they're located in Rocheport, Missouri. So you sh and they also have a website. Our second prize goes to Abby Statina. I may have said that wrong. That's a $10 e-gift card to Battlefield Lavender. They also have um, sell at the farmer's market and they do have a website. Our third door prize goes to Connie Seaver and that will be a $20 gift card to Giving Gardens here in Columbia, Missouri. Our fourth door prize is a $25 gift certificate to Songbird Station here in Columbia, and that goes to Mary Beth Jenny. Next is a $25 gift card to Helmy's Gardens, and that will go to Karen Butcher. 
And then lastly, Julie Vornholt will get a $50 gift card to Longfellow's Garden Center down in Center Town, Missouri, which is just outside of Jeff City. So you, we will get those in the mail to you. I'll have to get the addresses, the mailing addresses from, or the emails, we'll work this out, but you'll get them in the next couple of days if they're email and it'll take longer if we have to mail them. Okay, so next we have Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Okay, Matthew hey, is gonna, we, Matthew's gonna talk about growing fruit trees in our backyard here in Columbia, Missouri. Matthew manages the Columbia Center for Urban Agriculture's fruit trees at the Columbia Agricultural Park. It's actually fascinating if you've ever had to walk, chance to walk through them, it's really lovely, and other gardens across town. CCUA adopts a holistic approach to growing fruit trees and promotes tree health through cultivating a beneficial micro, oh no, microbial community and boast, boosting trees' natural defenses. He has been gardening with CCUA for five years and installs garden beds and plants fruit trees and berry bushes with residents. He is passionate about lowering the barrier of entry to growing food by making gardening concepts easily accessible. And so, Matthew, please go ahead. All righty. Um, let me get my screen shared here. Okay. Uh, well, great to talk with you all. It's been a couple of years, I feel like, since I've done a workshop. Uh, so it's nice to, to be back uh, talking with people, even if it's virtually. Um, fruit trees are one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, we, uh, we've been growing um, at CCUA, we've been growing some, some basic trees uh, for a pretty near to a a little over a decade now, some apple trees, pear trees, uh, peaches, uh, some tart cherries. Um, and then kind of over the last couple of years, we've started to branch out more into some different varieties um, now that we have a space here at our, you know, the, the new agriculture park. Um, and yeah, the, uh, on the screen here, I got some, some pictures. What, one of the highlights this year was a pear tree that we planted uh, around 11 years ago, um, located in a Columbia Housing Authority orchard that uh, finally produced this year, um, uh, around 125 pounds of fruit, and most of it's there on that table there at a by pantry. Um, so it's it's neat to you know even though I've been here for like like you said about five years, um, I'm I'm lucky to be here at the point where we're now seeing the harvest of some of these trees uh, start to kick in and, and really start to produce. Um, but yeah, uh, I kind of wanted to cover a few things today, uh, talking about what, uh, what people are able to plant here, what options people have, um, a little bit about choosing a site for your tree, a little bit about um, the actual process of planting the tree, and um, then also some details about caring for your tree, like pruning and spraying the tree um, and some things like that. So we'll get into it. Um, so first of all, I kind of like to begin this by just thinking about what people want to eat. You know, you don't, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to plant something that you're not gonna enjoy eating um, and and then thinking about whether that's possible or how how easy it is to grow something like that here. For instance, uh, my brother planted an apricot a few years ago, and and they do produce, but they also bloom pretty early in the spring. And so if you get a uh, a late frost, um, then it won't probably won't produce anything that year. Versus if you pick an appropriate cultivar of apple, you can be pretty sure that in about four or five years it'll start producing uh, fairly regularly. Um, so I, I kind of uh, classify some of our trees into two big groups, which one is those that require a lot of care and, uh, and then also those that don't require quite as much care. Um, so having an apple, a pear, a peach, or a cherry is a little more like having, having a pet in that they require uh, pruning every winter. 
Um, they're prone to disease and pest problems. And so they need some extra help um, through a spraying regimen um, in general. You know, sometimes you'll get the odd apple that nobody, you know, somebody forgot about and it's been in the back of a yard somewhere and it just produces a bunch every year. Uh, you know, you never know. But uh, in general, they tend to be a little more finicky and require a little more care. And part of that's just because they've been um, bred for so long for certain traits for the fruit that uh, they've lost some of their natural defenses. Um, and also part of it is in Missouri, it's wet and humid and we got a lot of pests and uh, some of these things, some, you know, apple, I think originally came from Kazakhstan, you know, so it's a little different here than its original home. Um, but they're delicious and so we grow them. Um, and then there's also some, some native trees that don't re really require much care. There's native plums is one we're now planting here at the agriculture park, um, just a couple of years old. Uh, and they grow in the wild and around in some of the woods around here. Um, and they're just delicious. They're kind of, they're about half the size of a plum you'd see at the store, but if you can pick them when they're ripe, they're just uh, extraordinarily tasty. Um, persimmon trees, uh, one of probably my favorite native tree is the persimmon. Uh, we we're planting a few varieties that are a hybrid between Japanese persimmons and American persimmons. So the Japanese is a little bigger, more like an apple size. And so these hybrids, uh, allow the Asian persimmons to take on some of those survival traits of our native persimmons here. Uh, mulberries, uh, really easy, probably some, for some people, a little more of a pest, I guess, than, than a desirable tree. I, I love mulberries. So put a tarp down underneath them and let them fall every year and just enjoy the harvest. Um, pawpaw trees, uh, another big favorite of mine. Um, fig, okay, so they, these last three are kind of a more, now sort of a novelty or interesting tree that I'm experimenting more with now. Figs, um, you can actually grow them here. It's a little more like a bush than a uh, than a tree because it doesn't. The upper part of the tree doesn't survive through the winter, um, and so you usually cut it back to the ground every fall or um, do some sort of like putting a some wire mesh or chicken wire around the tree and filling that with straw around like the first five feet of the tree to keep that part alive. Um, but it will pop either way. It'll kind of come back every year from the soil and could grow to be eight feet tall or so and, and produce figs. Um, and uh, there's some varieties I'll mention later that uh, uh, will be important to help keep it thriving in this climate. Um, last two are a couple new ones for me, but uh, this jujube is a uh, Chinese tree um, it's also known as Chinese date. It produces a little fruit about a, two inches long or so. Um, some of our jujubes that we've planted um, a couple of springs ago are already producing now. So they're pretty Im impressive um, in just that speed, that turnaround time. Um, chi tree, uh, also known as the Chinese melon tree, is a new one for me that um, can be grown here as well. Uh, it's, it's actually re related to the Osage orange, um, but it's edible. It's a little red berry, kind of looks like a little brain. Um, and we're waiting on that one to, to see if it, it produces well here. So a little more experimental for us, but, um, it comes with some nations from, from, uh, some other growers, uh, in the area. So, uh, and part of the reason those last couple don't require as much care is that they're new to this area, so they may not uh, experience the same pest pressure as maybe Apple does, uh, because the pests haven't found their way here yet <laughs> to eat uh, the jujube. You know, maybe one day, hopefully not. Um, so, um, kind of once I think part of what goes into deciding. Uh, what to plant is what space you have available. Um, if you're planting something like, you know, a, a apple or pear, um, pawpaws or persimmons, those will require cross-pollination. So you'll need at least a couple of those. Um, I've kind of 
been airing on the side of three uh, more lately, uh, just to ensure pollination. Um, and while, when you're picking those varieties, uh, there's some helpful resources I found that uh, can show when the, if the bloom times are overlapping, which is important um, to make sure that those flowers are blooming and can be pollinated uh, at the same time. Um, but in general, uh, kind of looking at your yard, um, the more sun, the better. You know, I usually say, you know, a minimum of six to eight hours of sunlight. But if you have more than that, that's preferable. Um, morning sun is a little more helpful than afternoon sun because it can help dry off that morning dew, um, especially with uh, fungal problems being such a big issue here. Uh, that can be really helpful. Um, and just like any plant recommendation, you know, getting having a loamy, a sandy soil that drains well is preferred. Um, if you have one of the many yards in Columbia that's very heavy with clay and waterlogged, like we have here at the agriculture park, um, there are ways you can improve the soil, uh, mainly through kind of building upwards. So actually bringing in extra topsoil and compost and mulch and creating essentially a berm um, so that your tree, uh, most the majority of the tree's roots are kind of like a foot above where the ground starts, um, which is a big job. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you dig down the clay and put your tree in it, and no matter if you add compost and other amendments to the soil, it's still going to fill with water and um, be a problem. So um, we've been doing that a lot of that here at the agriculture park. We uh, prepared an area with uh, a lasagna garden or sheet mulch, about seven layers of uh, compost and straw and different soil amendments stacked on top of each other, which over time are are going to decompose and, and create a better soil for the trees that we're planting. Um, uh, another way to think about it, or another approach, I guess, would be to remove the sod and plant something like, uh, like a cover crop like crimson clover, like a year ahead of time, um, to slowly start preparing the soil um, for your tree. Trees really don't like competing against um, uh, your grass, and so uh, re removing as big of an area as you can, maybe a four foot diameter circle um, of grass and replacing it with, with mulch will help uh, with that. Um, one way to, one rule of thumb I've read uh, for kind of judging if your soil is too waterlogged or not, um, or prone to be is, um, and I think you wanna do this at a time when it's when it's not flooded um, is to dig a hole in the ground about the size of, of a five gallon bucket and to fill the hole with water and then to wait 24 hours and come back uh, afterwards and see if the water's still there. So if it's still just holding the water and it hasn't leaked out or, at all, then that'll be a problem. You're gonna wanna think about building upwards. Um, otherwise, uh, we wanna, in, um, kind of choose a spot that, um, well, light wind, as I say here, can help with uh, deterring frost and disease. Um, the humidity is such a problem in Missouri. And so um, anytime we can allow things to dry out, anything like that that'll help us uh, will, will be important. Um, slopes encourage air movement. Um, the bottom of the slope wouldn't be a good spot because it's, it creates a frost pocket. So the, um, I'm not really sure how exactly it works, but when it free, when you, when it frosts, uh, that heavier watery air, I guess, will move down into these low spaces and, and create, um, a heavier frost, um, at the bottom of the hill or in an enclosed area. Um, I, f I find that slopes are a really good spot for fruit trees because oftentimes, it's not a place where we're using the land very much anyway. Um, you know, it's harder to build a raised bed garden on a slope or harder to play badminton on a slope. So oftentimes it can be a spot where you can make that area of your yard useful with a fruit tree um, where that you may have just been mowing before, you know? So I enjoy using slopes. Um, 
uh, house is a source of heat. So if you, you know, do really want to plant an apricot or um, even peach trees, you know, if you have a spot on the south side of your house, especially that can provide a little more heat and help it withstand some of the, the frost and the, the cold in the wintertime. Um, probably not in a huge measurable way, but it can be a boost. Um, okay, so uh, timing for planting. Um, I generally plant mid-March through April. Um, also have done some planting in the fall, uh, September and November and, or September through November. Um, I, uh, I find that I've, I've heard uh, kind of differing opinions on some of this. If you, I do know if you plant in the fall, you want to be sure and plant potted trees, not bare root trees. So whenever you order a tree online, um, it oftentimes is shipped as a bare root tree. So it's been it's been pruned down to a little stick called a whip, and it has a little cluster of roots um, that have also been pruned, and it's usually wrapped in like some wet newspaper with plastic wrap around that, um, and and that's what you plant. And um, I prefer to. I'm kind of more in the camp now of trying to get a tree that's uh, potted up already, so it doesn't have so much disturbance in that through that process. Um, but uh, I've seen successful trees planted in either of those times. Um, you want to, like when you get your trees, you want to try to plant as soon as possible. So the longer they stay, especially their bare root, the longer they stay um, uh, wrapped up like that and waiting to get into the soil, kind of the more stress they undergo. I mean, they can wait a few days, but you don't want to wait too long. Um, if you're waiting over a week, you want to do this process called healing in where you uh, dig a trench in the soil, put your trees at an angle and cover those roots um, with some soil or wet compost or something like that. Um, and the, I think when you would do that would just be if your site isn't quite ready yet or if you can't get out there in time to, to plant. Um, uh, soaking the roots in the in the water before planting is a good idea. It helps them survive that transplant stress. Um, the day you plant a tree is the most fragile time for the tree in life um, because it's been yanked out of the soil, it's been in the mail, it's going to a new spot. Um, so the little things you can do to help relieve that stress or reduce that stress uh, are important. Um, some people add some liquid kelp meal to that water, um, and that seems to help with the transplant shock as well. Um, but yeah, in the spring, if the soil is workable, if it's not frozen, you can plant. Um, if there's hard frost in the forecast, wait for a while. Um, don't plant when it's less than 32 degrees. Um, don't plant in soaked soil. Um, a cool overcast day is ideal. You know, if it's really hot and sunny and it's April and it's, you know, just a bright sunny afternoon, you probably want to wait for the next morning. Um, and again, if you, you know, if you break a couple of these rules of thumb, your tree is probably going to be, be fine. These are just ways to kind of boost its chances of, of thriving. Um, so uh, before planting, just I would advise Colin dig right because uh, you will be maybe going low enough you might potentially hit something uh, and trying to plant it also a little ways from your pipes will help too so your roots won't give you problems later. Um, this is a little picture this little picture right here demonstrates uh, kind of the technique of planting if you're if you have pretty good soil. Um, if your soil is really clay heavy and waterlogged you probably want to plant it up and farther out of the soil than in this picture. Um, but one thing to note is the size of the hole. So it's this, it's about twice as big as your root ball. Um, and the reason behind this is that you can, usually what I do is I bring a wheelbarrow, I dig all that dirt out, I put the dirt in the wheelbarrow, and then I mix um, my compost, my amendments um, with that dirt. So you get a really nice homogenous mix. And then I basically kind of add it back into the soil and scoop out almost like a hole for the root ball and place it down in there. Um, 
And as you're doing that, you want, you're laying out the, the roots of the tree. Um, you're carefully filling back in dirt um, around those little root zones. Um, your goal is to avoid leaving any type of airspace in there um, while also being gentle uh, with it. So it's a very, it's helpful to have somebody on top holding the tree and, and they're making sure it's straight up and down while you're down there kind of carefully scooping back in the soil um, around the roots of the tree. Um, I've got a note there about using a, a potato fork um, or you could use a pitchfork or something else like that, just to, even a shovel, just to make some kind of holes in the sides of that, uh, that barrel shaped hole that you're digging, um, just to help get, give those root spots where they, in the future, they can kind of reach out into the surrounding soil. Um, when you're digging that, it's really important, like while you're using your shovel to dig that you're not pressing back against the side of the hole because that will just make a really hard pan um, around the side of that barrel hole. So you usually want to turn your shovel perpendicular to the center of the hole so that you're not like compacting the soil around the side. Um, you want to kind of leave an environment where the tree feels like it can easily send roots out um, beyond this, the, the, uh, the holes area. Um, above that, we've got our uh, a little picture of our mulch that's going around the top of the tree. Um, some people add in a little bit of pea gravel right in around the trunk of the tree to reduce um, water or moisture buildup. Um, right there. Um, right above that is the graft union. So most of these trees, uh, apples, pears, and peaches, um, and cherries at least, are all probably going to be grafted trees if you buy them from a nursery. So they, they have a upper part called a scion that's grafted on the root ball below. Um, the root ball controls the size of the tree um, and affects things like disease resistance and um, nutrient uptake. Um, uh, yeah, above that, we've got, you kind of can see what your, a typical bare root tree would look like, just that little whip uh, without really any little branches off of that. From some nurseries, you can buy larger trees that, um, you know, that are three years old or more in big pots, uh, but I recommend buying younger trees because uh, the, tr the shock of a transplant will be just less for a smaller tree. So it will, it will be able to sort of um, accustom itself or become more accustomed to the new site quicker than a large tree will. Um, so some of those things that we're mixing in with the soil, with the soil are, like I mentioned, are two and a half gallons of compost, um, uh, rock phosphate, azomite, um, some arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, um, and sometimes I throw in some kelp meal too, some other mineral supplements. Um, but in general, the rock phosphate is a source of phosphorus for the tree. Um, azomite is, it's a product from Utah. Some of you might already use it in your gardens. It's just, it's a volcanic dust that, that has a long list of micronutrients. Um, and it's kind of a catch-all, you know, if you're not, if you haven't soil tested or anything like that, and you add some azomite and that'll increase your chances that you're not um, going to be left with a, some nutrient deficiency. Um, the reason we don't add more compost, you know, two and a half gallons isn't very much for a big, you know, four foot wide hole, is that you don't want to overfeed the tree and encourage it to become dependent on this initial source of food. So if we were to jam pack that hole with a lot more compost and more amendments, those roots would pretty much be content there and they kind of circle around that hole and never really kind of stretch out into the surrounding soil. And so um, in order to encourage it, we give it enough so that it can get a head start and kind of get some momentum um, but then after that point, it's encouraged to, to stretch out into the surrounding soil. Um, and by that time, it's also probably established more beneficial relationships with 
resident mycorrhizal communities, which can also help it absorb nutrients from maybe the heavier clay soil that's around that initial hole. Um, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi is uh, actually lives um, on the surface of the tree, so on its bark and its twigs and leaves and things like that. And part of what that does is help colonize the surface of the tree, so it's it'll be less likely to be uh, invaded by a type of fungus, other types of fungus that you won't want. So it's a beneficial fungus. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, if deer are present, install a fence. So we've got those at all of our trees here at the agriculture park. We've just got some five foot welded wire with a T post. Um, and that, that'll, that'll help you out. Um, there's also, I don't have a picture over here, but some plastic trunk guards. Um, if uh, you find rabbits are chewing the bark off your little saplings, um, or if you're getting uh, sun scald damage in the, in the winter time, um, it's good to be preventative about that and, and install those around your tree. Um, watering your tree for the first year, um, you want to be watering five gallons every week that you get less than one inch of rain. Um, that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, we use um, uh, watering bags from an online store called AM Leonard. Uh, garden supply store and they fill they hold more than five gallons they fill, hold about 20 gallons of water um, but they have two little spouts on them that slowly let water drip down into the soil and um, <clears throat> excuse me the reason that's helpful is because if you're if you just bring a bucket of water out and dump it on your tree well that's just going to flow away from from the spot. And so if you're letting drip irrigation slowly and uh, go down into the soil, it's going to get a lot deeper and also encourage the tree's roots to grow deeper too. Um, if you're watering too frequently and only at surface level, then the tree's going to kind of grow its roots up near the top um, because that's where the water is. Uh, so if you, whereas if you drip it down and it goes, the water gets down deeper into the soil, the tree's roots will grow deeper as well. Um, for a lot of these trees, after the first year, um, with that extra water, it's going to be okay and won't really need much water unless you're experiencing drought, which happens. Um, if it's everything's really dry, it's a good idea to um, to to water. Um, another good DIY way to water your trees via drip irrigation is just to get a bucket, five gallon bucket, and drill a couple holes and to the bottom of it and just set that next to your tree um, and, and fill that with water once a week. Um, it's a little less spread out because it's just coming from one point, but uh, still still can do the job. Um, so uh, pruning your trees, um, and this mainly pertains to those uh, first few trees, peaches, pears, and apples, and cherries. Um, uh, there's kind of three main approaches to, to pruning trees, uh, three main shapes. There's the central leader, uh, there's the modified central leader, and there's the open base. Honestly, I usually kind of think in terms of either central leader or open base. Modified central leader is oftentimes what comes about when I'm trying to uh, encourage a tree to have that central leader form uh, just because it it kind of has a life of its own and sometimes looks a little messier and I just say hey that's fine it's a modified central leader um, but in short the purposes of pruning them to these desired shapes are to encourage a strong structure so that as these trees are just loaded down with fruit uh, they won't uh, they will they won't break um, they'll be able to support that weight um, it's also to encourage space in the tree among the branches, among the leaves, to let sunlight and air movement in there um, so that you reduce your uh, fungal issues um, caused by uh, excess humidity and just packed trees um, or packed limbs. Um, and then also we're, we're just doing things like we're removing de dead and injured limbs. Um, Anytime there's crossing limbs, they'll rub against each other and create sores. So we're looking for those and, and picking which limb to remove. 
Um, we are removing limbs that are kind of steering back towards the center of the tree. If sometimes the more you do this, you kind of realize, hey, there's going to be a collision here in a year or so. And so if I cut this off now, that I can avoid that happening in the future. Um, and we prune all our trees every February. So kind of mid to late February, those last two or three weeks um, is when we do it. And the reason for that is, is uh, the tree is still in dormancy. And so it, uh, it's not gonna le be losing sap when we cut it. It's not gonna be you know, gushing, a gushing wound. Um, also bacterial and fungal um, problems are, they're dormant at that time too. So there's less chance of infection. Um, and the reason why it's not in January is because ideally, you know, it kind of depends on the year here, but it's, it's uh, a little closer to the end of winter. And so the tree isn't gonna experience the, these zero and single digit temperatures. Um, which can also actually cause some frost damage. Um, so if we were to plant, you know, if we were to have pruned in early January and got these really cold last couple of weeks that could have potentially frozen some of those sores and caused the frost to work its way into the tree a bit. Um, we don't uh, do any type of painting or anything like that over the, the wounds of the tree. I find they, we find they heal up pretty well um, by themselves. Um, yeah, and so uh, peaches are pruned open base and then pears and apples and cherries are that central leader style. Um, mulching, uh, so uh, just a few things I'll say about mulching. It, it really helps retain that water, um, keeps it more moist around the tree. I would say you wanna avoid landscaping fabric that creates like a, uh, like that plastic fabric can create a, just a layer of bacteria and underneath it and that mulch really isn't decomposing and going into the soil. So it's sort of like an anaerobic, well, just like a not really bioactive zone. Um, so one alternative to that is, you know, uh, oftentimes when I plant a new tree, I'll put some uh, paper mulch or like thin cardboard around the tree underneath the, the mulch and that is there long enough so that the uh, the, the weeds may be killed off, but it'll decompose over time too and kind of integrate with that, that system. Um, using hardware chips is a good idea. The softwood conifer chips often contain uh, some tannins in them, which um, discourages growth of other plants and um, uh, isn't really helpful to add. Um, straw and grass clippings encourage a more bacterial dominated environment. Um, with trees, we're looking for a fungal dominated environment. So that's why we use our hardwood mulch. Um, so uh, just a bit about our what we do to spray for our trees. This is a approach recommended by the Michael Phillips, who wrote this book, The Holistic Orchard. Um, the whole idea is to kind of boost the health of your tree um, rather than uh, treating the tree retroactively um, in order with the idea that if you're boosting the health of the tree, it's less likely to become infected by, uh, by fungus and, and bacterial problems. Um, so this is a mix that we put together. It's, um, uh, it's all organic stuff. There's no chemicals in it. You're not going to be harmed by it. Um, it's just liquid fish, some neem oil, um, active microbes, uh, some soap to help that oil mix into the water, uh, molasses to feed the microbes, and then kelp, which is a kind of a multivitamin for the tree. Um, and so it's both a way of feeding the tree and then also just establishing beneficial communities of microbes on the tree's surface. Um, think of it kind of like probiotics for your gut but pro it's probiotics for the tree. And so the idea is if these beneficial bacteria are living on the surface of the tree, um, it'll be less likely to be colonized by, by other non-beneficial bacteria. And the healthier the tree is, the more its natural defenses can kind of resist um, uh, disease. So we've been doing this with all our trees for the last decade. And there are some downsides, you know, if you don't want popular way to treat fungus is with copper, um, which is antimicrobial as well. 
Um, we don't do that uh, because we want to protect our healthy microbe communities. And that can result in having some fruits with a, a few spots on them, you know, something you wouldn't maybe see in a grocery store, but also those little spots like fly speck or something like that are, can just be rubbed off and they're not going to, not going to hurt you. So I, I like that approach. Um, but if you're really wanting for some really nice looking fruit, you know, there's some other options you can do um, to control for fungus and things. Um, yeah, well, that's my time. Uh, I've got a few uh, resources that anybody interested in uh, can link up with me after if they want just some ideas on uh, some lists of good varieties and orchards and nurseries to buy uh, trees from. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I guess I'll just close also with, um, you know, Columbia Center for Urban Agriculture. We're a nonprofit, but uh, we have a team that called Garden Pro that can do services for hire. So if anybody wants um, a consultation or some garden coaching around this type of thing, or if you're having problems with your fruit trees, um, you can reach out to, to me and um, we can also plant trees for you, uh, prune, teach you how to prune, teach you how to uh, use the spray or do that for you. So, um, yeah, feel free to, to reach out. Okay. We have a few questions. Um, somebody would like to know if your the CCUA spray helps with Japanese beetles. It does not. Um, the last couple of years, so a couple of years ago, I did find a, uh, type of bee, uh, a type of bacterial spray called Bacillus thuringiensis or BT that's often used for caterpillars in the garden. Um, but it's a, a, a strain of that that is anti-Japanese beetle. And I was ready to use it, but the last couple of years, we really haven't had uh, problems with them. So cross that continues okay. to be the case, but we have that on hand if that becomes a problem. So Okay. Um, also, someone was curious where you can purchase the, the large water bags for trees. Yeah, that's uh, A.M. Leonard. Um, if you just, that's their website name. Um, I would probably just Google that. Capital A period, M period, Leonard. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Can I, I, I was there. Uh, what type of fig tree did you recommend? Can you hear me? Looks like Matt may be frozen. Oh, I thought it was me. Okay. Well, I'll, well, someone wanted to know how you can join the garden club and maybe you can type in our Gmail for me. It's discovery garden club.com no excuse me discovery garden club at gmail.com and we'd love to have new members and another thing is this year we are going we haven't had a plant sale for a couple of years so we're going to have a plant sale so if you might be interested in um, shopping at our plant sale this spring it's usually the weekend after mother's day and it's the way we can uh, put on events like this for the community. So it would be wonderful if you wanted to stop in and we answer questions and things. It's actually usually a very fun event. Um, and I think we did lose Matt. So I think we're done. Because <laughs> I can't answer these fruit tree questions. I'm very sorry. Let's see if we can find his, um, I'm going to find his email address really quickly. And oh, put, yes. Put that in that would... the chat. So if people do have questions, um, it's uh, Matthew. Oh, here he is. He's coming back. Oh, he's back. <laughs> Yay. Hey, you're back. Hey, sorry. I think my internet just Oh, mine's been, mine's been bad too. So I think it's just, I don't know. Who knows? Oh, someone had a quick question. They were curious about the bush cherries that they see growing in the woods. They're called, she thinks they're also called Nan King cherries. Do you know anything about that shrub? Yeah. Yeah, we've planted a couple of those here. Uh, those are related to dogwoods, actually. They're also known as Chinese dogwoods. Um, and they've produced some really tasty little cherries so far, actually. They seem to really like this, this spot. Um, trying to remember, they're, they're available from a number of nurseries. I'm pretty sure One Green World has them. Um, 
Burnt Ridge Nursery also might be another one that has them. Um, yeah, I hadn't heard of them. Another question someone had was about uh, the fig trees that grow oh, yeah. in this area. What varieties oh, right. have you had? The main, the main one that we've had success with is Chicago Hardy Fig. Okay. Um, I would recommend that one. I've heard of another one. I'm trying to remember. It's uh, maybe turkey something that other people have grown successfully, but Chicago Hardy is the one I can vouch oh, for. Okay. That'd be fun to try. I've never, I, I just assumed they wouldn't grow here. I would never have thought. Yeah, they're fun. They, it's, there's nothing like eating a fresh fig. <laughs> they're, they're really good. Yep, I think we've lost them. I know. And it's one of my favorite things. Um, here's another question. I hope you can hear me. Uh, do you know anything about the variety romance cherry? No, I don't. I Did haven't heard of that one. Okay. Is that a tart cherry or a sweet cherry? Oh, Would someone just mentioned brown turkey fig. Oh, okay, that's the, yeah, I have heard of that. People growing that one yeah. here in Missouri. Mm -hmm. We grow some other varieties of cherries. Um, North Star is a popular tart cherry for this area. Um, I've heard of people growing Montmorency successfully um, as well. Great. Well, I it looks like we may have lost Janet now. She is frozen for me. So I will I will go ahead and wrap things up on behalf of the Garden Club. Um, uh, if you want to visit their website, I'm putting that in the chat now. And uh, you can check that out and it has more information about upcoming events that they're having and their plant sales and membership and then if you're interested in upcoming library events i'll put that in the chat as well events.dbrl.org um, thank you all again for being here thank you kelly and thank you matt for joining us um, this oh. afternoon oh there's janet did you want to say back yeah <laughs> a couple more to wrap up yeah no uh, well, well thank you very much matthew i learned a great deal and um and you and kelly were just wonderful and it was programs topics we haven't touched on yet so that's it's there's so many garden well thanks it was it was great to be here and come out and visit us at the agriculture park we'll be doing workshops this spring and we have a pretty active volunteer group of volunteers are helping us plan all this stuff uh this spring we're planting hundreds of perennials out there so it'll be a fun time to just watch it progress over time and watch those things go in so excellent all right well thank you everyone so much for being here thank you to janet and the discovery garden club uh, she'll be reaching out to those winners of our gift cards and um have a lovely rest of your sunday and we hope to see you all in person next year yeah. take care <laughs> okay bye <laughs> thanks everyone appreciate it